Let's all stand and clap our hands to the Lord and welcome his presence into this building. Come on, we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a God of great mercy and great power, a God who's wonderful in all that he does. How many love him today? Hallelujah, he's great. Oh, he's great and he's greatly to be praised. I mean, believe he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. There's none like him. There's one that's set upon the throne, amen. Aren't you glad you know what his name is today? Do you believe he's in control? He's not wearied with time. He's not concerned or controlled by politics or economics. He is the master and knows exactly what's going on. And I'm telling you, those that are connected to him do not have to worry, do not have to be afraid. He said in Luke 21, he said, their hearts shall fail them for fear. He said, but to you, don't be troubled. The world's going to be fearful, but the church doesn't have to be troubled. These things must come to pass. And when we realize we're on his side and he is our king, I don't have to worry about what's going on. Amen, amen. The church doesn't have to be fearful. The church doesn't have to be worried. The church can look up and say, redemption's on the way. He's going to take care of his people. How many believe he's going to take care of us? Clap your hands and praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Today we will be reading from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. And we will be talking today about Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the image of the image. He saw a sort of a metal man and was very troubled. And while you're turning there, when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, he didn't know the in interpretation of the dream. Matter of fact, he even forgot the dream. And he had these astrologers, people that worship the stars. He had wise men and Chaldeans paid to be wise in his council. Even would have, he would have considered them somewhat spiritual. And when they could not, he said, I'll just kill them all. You know, I just get, you're worthless to me. I'll just kill everybody that can't give me the answer to what I'm looking for. In this period of time, Daniel, Daniel looks at this, this moment and he, he says to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, which y'all, we shouldn't better know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because that's the, that's the Babylonian Chaldeish names they were given. But he said, we need to, we need to pray or we're going to perish. Did God give us the interpretation of this dream? And Daniel sought the Lord. He received the interpretation of it. And he, he, he told the council, tell the king to wait. Let me seek the Lord. And he received not only the interpretation of the dream, because he didn't know the dream, Daniel saw the dream as well. And so he's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream and the interpretation. And look what it says. He says, Daniel 2 and 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. It was great. It was magnificent. This Image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then, and let's just look, stop here for a minute. Let's look at the image that he saw. This is a modern day depiction of what he saw. That wrong one. The one with Nebuchadnezzar, the golden head. There you go. This is, this is sort of a depiction of what he saw. The, 
the gold, golden head, the breast, the, 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 the silver arms. He had a bronze stomach and thighs, brass, and uh, he had, what does it say here? It says, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. God bless you, you may be seated. Let's continue reading, okay? This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the end time. He says um, in verse 35, Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Are y'all with me? Let's follow. Let's, let's follow what Daniel says. Thou, old king, are a king of kings. He's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, old king, are the king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. He's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, God has raised you up. Now, he's a heathen king. But the Bible, called, Brother Marks, we're so glad to have you today. Let's welcome our evangelist. We're so glad he's here. And when he tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream he had, as Nebuchadnezzar is hearing the dream, he starts remembering the dream, and he tells him the golden head of this image, the golden head, it's you, O king. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And whosoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the, of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And God had raised him up. And I, I'm going to tell you here today that Nebuchadnezzar forgot that God had raised him up. And he started taking glory for his kingdom and God humbled him. God raised him up and then humbled him. How many know that? And humbled him. He grew talons and feathers and grazed like a cow in the field for seven years because he began to take the glory and, and steal the glory, not, not understanding that God hath raised him up. And you will look on and see, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes no it's not just feet we saw feet and toes there's ten toes part of potter's clay and part of iron the kingdom shall be divided there and there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another even as the iron is not mixed with clay and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Somebody say, we are a part of that kingdom. How many believe that? We are a part of the kingdom. You're, you're not just church members. You are a part of the kingdom. You weren't just baptized to escape hell. You were a part of, a part of a kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom and we have one king, amen, and he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. <laughs> Praise God, amen. It goes on, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. 
So when you begin to look at the word of the Lord and what Nebuchadnezzar, who God was using, he was not a righteous man, was not a holy man. He is a heathen king that the Bible says that God declared him as his servant. The Bible tells us that God's, that, that God, the, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. He can harden it and he can soften it. Harden it and soften it like he did Pharaoh's heart. He can set up and he can tear down. Do not think that God is, is, is off the throne because things do not go politically, economically eh, the way you think they should go. God is not in trouble. He is in control and he knows exactly what is going on. And if we are not careful in the end time, we will allow the news anchors and news systems to steer the narrative to bring the fear that goes to the world, to bring the same fear that causes their heart to fail, to cause the church's heart to fail. So you think, what's going on? Are we going to make it? Are we going to be okay? You're going to be okay. God's children are not given to wrath. Amen. And there's some of these things that he will not allow to happen while we are here. Do you believe that? Last week I talked about before he could bring, the angels could bring judgment, he told Lot, we can do nothing while you're here. You've got to get out of Sodom or the wrath cannot come. There are some things that will not happen while we are here. Oh, but one of these glorious days when the roll is called up yonder, I'm going to be there. I'm not staying here. This world is not my home. I've got a mansion on the other side. Amen. I've got a home beyond this home. I've got a land beyond this land. I belong to a kingdom, amen, that's bigger than the kingdom that you see. I'm a very patriotic American. I love America, but I am loyal to that kingdom more than I am this kingdom. Praise the name of the Lord. Be careful to get caught up in politics. Be careful to get so caught up that all you talk about is, is, is the U.S. All you talk about, who's the president? Democrat, uh, Republican, uh, other, other political platforms. Be careful that you get emotionally connected to stuff that is temporary. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. And we need to be looking up with our hand over our eye, looking for that cloud that's coming from the east with our king riding on it to come and deliver us and to take us to that place that God has prepared for us. Amen. So when this happened, I love what I'm going to tell you right now. We'll get into the image. We'll, we'll break it down into time and just here in a moment. But you imagine when this king that God had set up who was like a, a, great, a great tree that all the nations, everybody would come and feed under that tree. Nebuchadnezzar had that. It was him that was the tree. And um, he became lifted up in himself. But when he had this dream, he's very troubled by the dream. He's very troubled, very troubled by it. Even, even Daniel, when he saw it, was troubled by it. And he looks at, he looks at his companions. He he says to them, he said, listen, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, we, we've got we to seek God. He said that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He goes on and says, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision, a night vision. Daniel sees the dream. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So Daniel sees the image. He sees, go ahead and put that image back up there. He sees the image of exactly what Nebuchadnezzar had seen. The golden head, the, the silver arms, the uh, um, Bible talks about the, the belly and the thighs brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, the stone, which we believe is Jesus Christ. And when he sees this, he is troubled. But when he sees it, he gets the revelation of it. He understands something very, very, very powerful that we cannot miss here today. And Daniel, Daniel when he got it, he realizes, number one, right now, I'm not going to die because I've got the secret. I understand the dream. I've got the answer, what the king's looking for. I understand it. And when he does, a spirit of thanksgiving comes on to him. It's like you're going to die, but now you're going to live. I think we do the Bible 
People in the Bible that are mightily using the Lord, I think we do them a disservice to think they're an anomaly and they're just like some robot that this there just does what God says. They are as human as you and I are. They get up with emotions. They got to seek the Lord. They deal with the things that you and I deal with. Daniel would. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. He was thankful that he wasn't going to die. But he's also thankful for what he sees in this interpretation. And he says in verse 21, let's look at this. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. Let's look at this verse here today. Daniel 2 and 21. Amen. And he changed the times. Watch. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. When he sees the interpretation, he says, oh my goodness, he's the king of kings. He's not a king. He's the king of every king that's going to exist. Amen. The heart of the king is in his hand. It is God that sets up the king and tears that king down. He realizes what God is and who God is and how powerful that he is. He is the king. Can I tell you today, you don't have to worry about China. You don't have to worry about Russia. You don't have to worry about anything. God has it all in his hand. Come here, Finn. Run up here. You'll probably see after every church service, these boys... I asked him, I said, what do you want for Christmas? He said, I, I, want, I, want a, I want a game of chess. That's what he told me. And I didn't see it coming. And uh, go ahead and set that up. He said, I want one that's portable. I can take with me. And so everywhere he goes just about, he's got a chess game. And he's really good at it. I don't know how to play chess. But he knows how to play chess very, very well. And he he's, he's plays online. He the boys out here, how many have seen the boys out here playing chess after church? And boys and girls out there playing chess. That's what they like to do. It's in the school. That's their favorite pastime now. A lot of these young men, young women, they love to play chess. The whole concept of chess is you've got to guard the king. The purpose of, ke- of chess is you guard this king. You, you can't let the king be taken by the opponent. It's like two nations fighting against each other. And so it's kingdom against kingdom and you have the pawns and the queens and what else do you have? I don't know what else you have over there. What is it? You got the bishop. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. You've got all of these pieces and they can move certain ways. And any of you, any of you chess players in the building? How many chess players we have here? My land. I'll play checkers. And we get crowned king every now and then, all right? But this is kingdom against kingdom. And when I was reading this, I, I pondered a story I heard many years ago that in Europe, in Europe, they, they have a, a, a master, grand master championship of checkers. That, that There's a mural that is there that have been there since the 1800s. And in that mural, there is a chess player that is, that is playing what looks like the devil. And, and it says that you look and the chess player is defeated and the name of the mural is checkmate. It's checkmate. When you say checkmate, that means the king is blocked and he has no more moves. You've got him cornered. There's nothing else he can do. He's been conquered. And when you, am I right, Finn, that when you get to a point, the whole point is to be able to say checkmate. Is that right? Why don't you just say checkmate? That was weak. You got to say checkmate as if you want. Say checkmate. checkmate. All right, checkmate. And here he is, they're playing, they're, they're playing this Grand Masters Championship and one of the, the, the Grand Masters professionals looking at the mural that is there and said that when he was looking at it, all of a sudden he realized that the mural was wrong. The mural, the mural was wrong. All of those years they thought that the king was done, the king had been conquered, and the person that is sitting there, the, the, the chess player, is defeated, and all of a sudden he looks up and he says, looking at this mural of the defeated chess player, and he said, it's wrong. He breaks the silence in the room, and he said, the king has one more move. Can I tell you when the Antichrist and all the stuff that's being set up and it looks like the church is going to be defeated, don't you think for a minute that the king has been conquered? 
He's the stone that was cut out of the mountain. Amen. He's coming back with a glorious, victorious church. Amen. He is going to deliver Israel. He's going to establish his kingdom, a kingdom that will be established forever and ever and ever. Can I preach to you that the gospel that was preached by Jesus and his disciples was not the gospel of Jesus Christ? That when Jesus walked, you can be seated, when Jesus walked on the earth, God manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, the son of man, the son of God. When he came and he preached the message, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. They would go from house to house saying, the kingdom is near you. The kingdom is nigh to you. What was he talking about? He's talking about this kingdom right here that will be established forever. You are not a member of the anchor church. You are a, are a member of the kingdom of God and Jesus is your king. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega. He said, I'm the beginning and the ending, which is, which was, which is to come. The Almighty. Can I preach to you for a moment? They conquered him and appeared at Calvary when he died. Hell, hell began to rejoice. But on that resurrection morning, as a stone cut out of the mountain, he came out with dominion and authority and power. The Bible says that that the principalities, when they saw what happened because of his resurrection, they would have never touched him. They would have never heard him because when he come out of the tomb, he was alive as the king of kings with dominion over hell, over death and the grave. He's got the, kings, the, the keys in his hand. Somebody shout, he is my king. Oh, I hope today I can bring him glory because there's none that compares to his power, none that compares to his mercy. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Come on, is he your king or is the devil your king? Do you love the kingdom or do you love the world? Oh, no, I love him and I love his kingdom. Praise God. And so when I'm, re when I'm reading this, when I'm reading this, grab the king. Oh yeah, this is, the, this, is, this is the battle of nations. This is the battle of kingdoms. This is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. God isn't one of the pieces on the board. He's the chess player. He's got the king in his hand. He can move it how he wants to move it. He's got, listen to me right now. He's got the king in his hand. And what, what Daniel was saying, throwing the image back up there, and the reason he started saying, he sets up kings and tears down kings. He realized that he said, this which shall come to pass hereafter. He said, these kingdoms that are going to come and they're going to go. One's going to rise and another one's going to show up. That it is God that does not age with time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I come to tell you, we do not serve a weak, weary, and tattered God. I don't care how great the king thinks he is or how flexy the flex of the kingdom, it doesn't matter. God has it right in his hand. Do you believe this today? And he told Nebuchadnezzar, hold that piece in your hand. He told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, he said, you are the image of gold. He said, but what will happen is there's gonna come another kingdom. Your kingdom's not always going to be here. He said, you're the kingdom of kings, verse 37. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. Hold that, hold that king up in your hand. Show him that king. He set you up. He can set you down. He said, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thy, thy hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee, because you're not going to live forever, you can put their body in coffins in pyramids because pharaohs thought they were gods. Oh, well, yeah. The word Elohim means plural, plur, plurality of God. It doesn't mean there's a plurality of persons. It means he can be whatever he wants to be anytime he wants to be. He looked at Moses when he was going to go before Pharaoh. And the Bible says he told Moses, I'm going to make you an Elohim to him. How many Moseses were there? 
There was one. What he was saying, I'm going to put my power upon you. And when I put my power upon you, Moses, you're going to have more power than all of their musicians. Magicians and their people that are there. You're going to have power upon you. And how many know that he threw the rod upon the ground and became a serpent? And they threw their rods and became a serpent. But Moses' rod ate all of the other serpents, meaning the power of God is always more powerful than any kingdom. They thought they would be God. They were worshipped as gods. But God set Moses up to break down that kingdom and to set the children of Israel free. The same way here is God has raised up Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar thinks he really is somebody because everybody's looking at how powerful that he is. He said, but your kingdom is going to fall. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. When you begin to look when he saw that the next kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, you look and the next kingdom was the breast and arms of silver. This was the kingdom that came up, which was the Mede and the Persian kingdom. So you got the arms of silver. In 538 BC, Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians. That's why you're going to see that even in the scripture where there was the Medes and the Persians. Darius was the king of the Medes and Daniel actually saw this happen. Because you'll find in chapter 9, Daniel is there with, the, with Darius, the, the king of the Medes. And you'll go on to chapter 10 and Gabriel visits, da- Gabriel visits Daniel chapter 9. How many of you remember me preaching about that? In the land of the Medes, another word for that was media. And you'll find that, that, that Michael even shows up in the scripture. You'll find in chapter 10 where the king of the Persians. Are you all right? Are you okay up there? All right. And uh, he said Darius was the king of the Medes. The Persians eventually became dominant. This kingdom initially, initially a dual kingdom as portrayed by the two arms was to last until 330 B.C. I get so worked up preaching about Christ, I, I can't help it. I get so emotional about this. This is real. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I wouldn't miss another church service. I wouldn't miss another opportunity to give. I wouldn't miss another opportunity to reach somebody. He says, after this kingdom, he said the belly and the thighs were of brass. This is Greece. Alexander the Great came out of the West with conquest on his mind. He conquered the Persian Empire in 330 B.C. and established an empire based on Greek language and culture. After Alexander's death in 323 B.C., the empire was divided into four parts among his four generals. The Grecian empire lasted until 160 B.C. when the Romans conquered it. You will see here that the legs of iron, which was the Roman empire, suggesting the east and the west. Do you see that? And you will see that this was of iron. Nothing, iron can conquer anything. It hits metal, the hardness of the iron. And you will see that this this kingdom lasted for a long time. This was the Roman Empire, but you will see that the feet of iron and clay, uh, the feet portray a revived Roman Empire. Let's stop here for a minute. They never thought the Roman Empire, the conquer the world, would ever ever die. But the Roman Roman Empire died. Show that picture of my my family and I. This was just last year. We were in Rome, and uh, we went to the Colosseum of Rome. The lady that gave us, the lady that gave us the tour, she said 500,000 Christians were martyred in the Colosseum. They would come from all over. You can see that. And uh, right here, it's a little bit blurry today, but right here in this part, there's a cross. The cross is in where the Roman leader would have been. The cross is sitting, standing strong in his seat. Meaning that Christ conquered the Roman Empire because he sets up kingdoms and he tears down kingdoms. Those kingdoms are for seasons. They never thought the Roman Empire would be conquered, but it became conquered. And I am there with, I'm I'm telling you, that is a massive Colosseum. They could put 80,000 people in that Colosseum in 15 minutes. A thousand sailors would pull curtains over because of the intense heat of the sun. They could, a thousand sailors would pour a, pull a covering. I mean, the massive, the, the, the grandness of that kingdom 
And they was a bloodbath, bloodthirsty culture. And that's still present today. It's called Hollywood. Y'all, I'm telling you right now, you better be careful. Watching all this marvel and all of this witchcraft and all of this stuff that, that glorifies and pro projects the spirit of the Antichrist, that spirit that's on the age, and get entertained by it. And you can get all emotional, all worked up over a movie, but can't get moved by a church service in the kingdom of God. Oh, I warn you today, you better be, be careful of that end time spirit. Be not deceived. The Roman Empire fell, but what happens is it's when you see the feet of iron and clay, you're going to see that it's going to be powerful and brittle. You cannot get clay and iron to stick very well. It's there. You can get it to bond, but not bond well. You will see that it says the feet and the iron of clay. This is a revived Roman Empire. The feet portray a revived Roman Empire, a ten-nation confederacy, represented by the ten toes, Daniel 7 and 7 verse through 7 and 8. Um, and uh, let's look at that, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 through 8. He said, after this I saw in the night visions. Are, all, are you with me today? I saw the night visions. Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured, it, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first, horns plucked up by the roots. Behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. When you go to Revelation, because Daniel, Daniel and Revelation coincide in what was seen in the end time. Revelation 17 and verse 12 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Everybody say the beast. And so when he saw this, he saw ten nations, ten toes, begin ten horns, you begin to see this. And this is the revived Roman Empire in the end time. Because I believe, as you've heard taught, there will be one, one government, worldwide government, one, one language, one financial system, and they're going to have an antichrist and a false prophet in the end time as that leader. And I think we have to be careful here because in the end time, if we're not careful, we can be enamored by the woman. The woman that Revelation 17 Maybe you'll come up and help me in a minute. Thank you, Finn. I believe he's going to turn 12 and not be in the children's ministry anymore on Tuesday. Isn't that something? I'm getting older, but I'm not old. <laughs> let's look at Revelation 17. Let's, let's, let's look through it. Verse, chapter 17 and 1. Somebody say, preach the word, Pastor. And, they, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, John begins to speak about this. Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Seduction is a part of our culture. Yes, it is. Lust and seduction, pornography, and you, you can't, it, it, is, it, is, it is so much a part of the atmosphere of where we are. The way people dress, the way people think, the immorality of relationships. And she's very, very seductive and beautiful to look at. So he says, so he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness and I saw a woman sit up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple Scar and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. God help us not to fall in love with things that God hates. Abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And up upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, 
Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. That spirit is rampant. There's Christians dying. We just had, we just had a couple that, a young couple in Haiti, apostolic missionaries that were martyred just a few days ago. Young couple killed by the gangs in Haiti. God, help us, Lord. They were martyrs. Present day, a part of the kingdom of God, martyred. That spirit is rampant, and this woman is drunk by the blood of the martyrs of Christ. God, forgive us for loving and being seduced by the spirit that hates everything we stand for. I'm going to say it again. You've got to be careful to entertain yourself with stuff that hates God, hates what we stand for, hates what we preach. We can't let it in our home through Facebook, social media, television, Hollywood. God, come on, I know. I, I, I've got people that can't stand me for some stuff that I preach, but I'm not worried about them because this isn't for the mockers and the scoffers. This is for the believers and those that love his way. Love his way. Hallelujah. I don't want to be enamored by this world. This woman of seduction. You know, you know it's typical culture that we follow whatever the UK does. It's called the Europeanizing of America. Oh yeah, the way they dress, the way they live, the way they think, the way they view relationships and immorality, that whatever they do, we follow. It's the Europeanizing of America. We follow their way. What is that? That's the arising of the modern day Roman Empire. And he said this woman rides upon the beast. Let, let, let's, look, let's, look, let's look at something. When the European Union was formed, you can go there in, in Brussels and you'll find this outside of, a, of a, the European Union. Let's look at this image. What is it? It's the woman... Riding upon the beast. You can take the euro, even on the euro dollar, the, some of the euro coins, and you will find it's a woman riding upon the beast. I'll never forget N.A. Urshan many, many years ago, 25, 30 years ago, he talked about the euro, the world financial system, the euro, and he pulled it up, and on it was 666 was the mark that was on that coin. And just because it hasn't happened in 30 years, doesn't mean that this vision that he saw all the way by Nebuchadnezzar's day and what John later saw when he saw the end time doesn't mean it's not going to come to pass. That woman is the spirit of, of seduction. It's, it's the same spirit that went with Jezebel that tried to fornicate with the prophets. That's why you need to pray for your preacher. Pray for the evangelists. Pray for the prophets. Pray for the men of God. There is a spirit of seduction that would love me to compromise holiness and truth to fall in so the church would be weakened. The Bible says in that day even the very elect will be deceived. People that have been in this for years, people that have loved God in here and all of a sudden they, they carried away, went beyond the foundational boundaries of holiness and righteousness and next thing you know they don't believe what they used to. People that could watch a video that would turn it off when some Somebody cussed and turn it off when there was some immorality seen or turn it off when there was sometime anti-God on it. Now can walk right through it, laugh and not be bothered by it. Why? Because in that day the conscience is going to be seared with a hot iron. They won't even be able to feel bad about things they used to feel bad about. I come to tell you we need an old-fashioned revival. We need an old-fashioned revival. We need an old-fashioned revival. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands and praise him. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Somebody shout, we need an old-fashioned revival. Oh, yeah. Lift your hands and say, God, I do not want to be deceived by the woman. I do not want to be deceived by the spirit of that woman of the end time. The harlot church, the, the spirit of seduction and false prophets and false prophecies. God help us. God help us to be a part of what he's doing. Oh yeah, I'll never forget. You can be seated as I come to a close. I believe that, that, that those, those two feet, iron and clay, powerful, but yet having a hard time getting together. That's why you find the United Kingdom broke away from Brexit. 
called it Brexit. They broke away from the European Union. What was it, 2016? But you know that the European Union, there's another, there's another picture I don't want to show you because a little bit illicit of the woman. I didn't feel comfortable showing that here. But the beast that they have also, another beast with a woman upon it, setting upon the beast, is, is the, the, the hindquarters of that beast is set upon ten coins, which was the ten founding nations of the European Union. Ten. And, and, and when you look at that, well, they, they say there's no significance of the ten, but when there's ten toes and ten horns and the Europeanizing, they call that woman uh, Europa. That's what she's called. I believe it represents the beast of the end time and the seduction of the end time. There's a, there's a, I pastor you, so I know you. There's a little bit of concern because some of you have fallen into American culture in the midst of Christianity. And you have bent yourself away thinking I'm just an old, some of you have lost, my voice have, has lost influence in some of your lives. And the reason is because you look so long at the harlot church, you can't hear what the Spirit's trying to say to the preacher that, sit, that, sit, that was sent to you by God. I was sent by the Lord to this church. And some of you no longer hear me because you got used to my voice. And you know that I still preach the same thing I preached for the last 20 years in this church following Bishop Ferris and Guy Smith. And I haven't changed. It's not me that's changed. It's you that's changed. <laughs> Pastor, you just need to give up. I'm going to tell you, God's going to come whether you're ready or not. God's coming after a church. That's, I want to be ready. I made my mind up, Brother Cody. I'm going to preach what God's given me to preach. Because I don't work for the body. I work for him. Amen. I want to be a man sent from my God. God's established his kingdom on, upon the earth. I'll never forget. You can be seated. Brother Billy Hale, I, I was in a meeting this year, and, and he said, I think it was 40 years ago, that God gave him a dream. And in that dream, there was a preacher that was standing at a pulpit. And the preacher was mesmerized at his own world. He was checking the stock market and seeing how much, and just, just the preacher was looking down and just, just sort of scrolling and, and said, looking at his own world and checking things he saw this 40 years ago. And he said, wow, he said, I came down into the room and said it was a banquet hall. And he said it was the church and people were sitting around the church and they were there and said all of a sudden a woman appeared and came right down before them. She was in a beautiful white, white looked like a white wedding gown and said so she just danced and twirled through the room and said so she was absolutely beautiful to look at, white and pure. And, and everybody began to look at her and was amazed while the preacher was consumed in his world, they were mesmerized what had showed up in the church. It said all of a sudden, this woman that was beautiful, arrayed in white, it turned to a scarlet ground and then purple. And said so she began to spin and the dress began to spin with her. And said so next thing you know, everybody's just talking about how beautiful she really is. And said so one table and after another, she would twirl down and she would take the purses and their valuables off the table and grab them and put them in a bag. And she'd twirl over to another group and said so she'd take the, the purse and the valuables off the table and put them in a bag. And so she trolled around to another group and she began to take what was valuable and said until she went to every table. And he said, I'm standing there watching it unfold while the preacher is looking at his own world, not even looking at his own church. He said she went from table to table to table to table until she, everybody in the room she had robbed and she slipped out the door. And he said, when I did, I took off running after her. You can't have what belongs to the church. You can't have what belongs to the people of God. He said, I grabbed the bag and I came back into the room and I began to go to each table saying, here's your stuff back and here's, here's what belongs to you. She was, she was a deceiver and here, take this. And said nobody cared because they were so enamored by her beauty. They didn't care that she took what belonged to them. God, is it possible that that woman that rides upon the beast can walk into your family and take hold of your convictions, take hold of your doctrinal values, take hold of your prayer time, take hold of, come on, I'm going to tell you, and you become so enamored with the world, you don't care that you lost your desire to do the things of God. You know what we need? We need an old-fashioned revival to where we get awakened for the time. We get awakened. Come on, stand to your feet and clap your hands. God, let there be an awakening. Let there be be an awakening let there be an awakening hallelujah hallelujah I don't want to be influenced by atheists and, and agnostics and haters of God I don't want them influencing my children I don't want them influencing my mind oh God send us a preacher Lord send us an old fashioned revival send us an old fashioned revival like we've never seen before
Look at your neighbor and say, I want it. I wonder where the church is open 24 hours because people want to come and pray for their loved ones and their family, their city and those that are around there. I want there to be an old-fashioned revival where young people want to pray. I believe it's happening. I look around at these young people. They don't want the world. They want the things of God. They say, I want to be a part of his kingdom, not their kingdom. Somebody say amen. amen. I hear it as I close, and it's 1045. I hear it as I close. Perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Boasters, proud, disobedient to parents. It's not talking about kids. It's talking about adults that rebel from the way that they were taught. Oh, yeah. He said, they'll have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. He said, from such turn away. I hear it. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times. I'm telling you, put that image back up there. Hallelujah. We're down at the feet. We're at the end time. We are, we are down at the feet. I preach to the last day church. I preach to the latter day church. I preach to the church right now that you're going to see the greatest revival and then harvest that this North American church has ever seen. Oh yeah, I stand here and prophesy. I will see it. I will see millions filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God has a church. I don't want anything in here that's going to keep me out of there. I don't want anything in here that's going to affect here that's going to keep me out of there. I want to, the old song says, keeping my record white, watching both day and night. Oh, I want to be ready. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hear an old-fashioned, I hear an old-fashioned revival that says, clean your houses out. If it's not like God, get rid of it. If it doesn't reflect his kingdom, get it out of the house. Tell your neighbor, he's preaching to us today. He's preaching a good message to us today. Which kingdom are you going to be a part of? I don't want to be a church goer. I want to be in the kingdom. The Spirit speaks expressive that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm convinced what some people are called the, broad, call the broadening of the mind is really the searing of the conscience. The broadening, oh, we're just smarter. We're just smarter than the last pastor. For the bounds, you're just not educated. I am. I got a degree in neology. I've been talking to the Lord. I'm over time, but I'm the pastor. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful. My goodness. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. I'm telling you, there's a revival come where people are going to fall in love with this like never before. I want to fall in love with him. One more time, lift your hands, oh God. Come on, lift your hands, God. I don't want to miss it. I do not want to miss it. Oh Lord, this... Roman Persian Empire that's rising up. This anti-Israel rhetoric that's going on right now is the spirit of the Antichrist of the age. The seduction spirit, the end time of fornication, adultery, and the illicit things, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Come to, come to the music. Come to the music. We're going to pray in between getting our kids and family worship service. I hear this. The only thing that can break it is Christ. The stone, the stone from the mountain is Christ. The only thing that's going to save you in this end time is a love for God. Come on, it's His grace, it's His mercy. He is the King of kings, He is the Lord of lords. I tell you today, if you're battling lust and deception and numbness and you've got anxiety and fear and depression, you've got only thing, can I tell you the only thing that can help you is Jesus Christ. He, he's the stone that will set you free. Do you believe that? Is there anybody here that says, I know he can? I'm preaching to people that some are troubled on every side. But listen to this preacher. When Jesus comes and touches you, he's going to give much peace and rest to your soul. It's only the stone that can set you free. It's only the stone of Christ. Somebody say amen. This room's going to be an altar. I want I, no fellowship here. If it is, quietly take it to the foyer. 
We're going to worship the Lord here in 10 minutes. We're going to start praise and worship and give honor to the King that has everything in control. But I think right now, let there be a call of repentance. God, forgive me for what I've allowed in my house. God, forgive me for what I've allowed in my ears, my eyes, and my heart. Come on, all over the building, I think we ought to find an altar of repentance. I don't want these things, oh God. Let's dim the lights for a moment. Let's find an altar and say, God, above all else, I must be saved. Can you sing that?